partner. My pronouns are she, are she and her. And I, uh, as Tracy had mentioned, I am a research advisor, equity, diversity, inclusion, and indigenization of the vice principal research portfolio. Uh, my academic background is in sociology and cultural studies. And I have over uh, 15 years of experience supporting community-driven research and uh, working in research environments in Canada, uh, Latin America, and Europe with a focus on uh, research collaboration with equity deserving groups. Um, it is a pleasure to connect with you all today. And uh, again, thanks so much, Tracy, and for, for inviting me. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that Queen's University is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee people. I recognize that there is a significant Métis community on this land and Indigenous people from other nations uh, across Turtle Island are present here today. I am grateful for the nurturance, wisdom, and guidance that these lands and the Indigenous people who are their caretakers offer to all of us who build um, our lives here. And I would like to acknowledge the uh, many privileges I enjoy as a white settler and an uninvited guest uh, living on these lands, such as uh, having access to food and housing and having a job at a university. Uh, and I'm committed to uh, leveraging these privileges to advance the process of reconciliation. So I'd like to um, encourage you to take a moment to reflect uh, on your own relationship with this territory and the gifts and responsibilities that come with it. Okay, so before we start, I wanted to ask, uh, I wanted to ask you what, what thoughts or emotions come to mind uh, when you hear the phrase inclusive research. Um, and I would invite you to put some ideas in the chat if you can, that would be wonderful. Um, so personally, when I think about uh, inclusive research, I think about the time when I first came to Canada as a PhD student. Uh, yeah, I think it would be like six or seven years ago now. And I was collaborating with an indigenous, urban indigenous organization in Toronto. And as a newcomer to Canada and a white settler, I didn't feel particularly confident, but um, the research environment or the research space uh, and the team that I was welcomed into was um, inclusive of both indigenous and settler perspectives. So I felt seen, I felt like my uh, opinions mattered and I uh, was credited fairly uh, and appropriately for all of my research contributions. So this is what comes to my mind when I think about inclusive research. Uh, so feel free to um, put some ideas in the chat. I see that, uh, uh, Anna has already put something. Yes, inclusive research as a means to challenge traditional hierarchies of knowledge. And of course, the co-creation piece is crucial. Cultural sensitivity, commitment to ethical collaborations, wonderful ideas. And of course, bridging gaps between theory and practice as well. Listening and learning from research collaborators and participants a more diverse selection of participants in research. Wonderful. Thanks so much for, for sharing your thoughts. These are all wonderful comments and I think a uh, very, very good starting point for us to move forward with the presentation. Um, just to give you a quick outline of my of my uh, presentation today we will start with uh, some background about the current IEDIA landscape and the Canadian uh, research ecosystem and at Queens as well to situate our work and I will also uh, flag the differences between IEDIAA and research design and IEDIAA and research practice uh, I will give you some examples of IEDIAA uh, requirements and different funding calls, and then we will move on to um, discussing the steps that are needed to uh, develop an IEDIAA and research practice action plan for your team and for your research environment. And then I will share some useful resources for further learning, and we will finish with, with a Q&A session. Okay, so uh, here's a quick list of definitions. I'm not going to uh, unpack, the, unpack them one by one. So if you are uh, new to equity work or if you uh, need a refresher, 
please feel free to uh, check out the glossary of terms uh, posted by Queen's uh, Human Rights and Equity Office. Um, however, I would like to point out that in 2022, uh, HRIO chose to adopt the IEDIAA acronym uh, in response to uh, the expressed needs of equity des deserving groups uh, at Queen's. And so the first I stands for indigenization and it is separated from EDII to um, highlight our responsibility to um, honor obligations to indigenous communities. Uh, and in recognition that these uh, responsibilities are separate and distinct from equity and inclusion efforts. And it also encourages us to think about indigenization first before we engage in equity work. So the two A's toward the end of the acronym stand for accessibility and anti-racism. The first A, which is uh, accessibility, is meant to address ongoing and long-standing community concerns about the persistent invisibility of people with disabilities and their voices within uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion work. And it's about making sure that programs, services, things, and environments are barrier-free to people with disabilities. Anti-racism was included in the acronym in acknowledgement of our institution's uniquely stark and serious history of white supremacy and racism, and in recognition of the um, ongoing contribution that the anti-racism movements on campus have made in positively uh, transforming our institutional uh, culture for the benefit of all. And there are also other uh, acronyms which are used as an umbrella term uh, for equity work, such as EDI, DEI, and EDII. Um, EDI is less comprehensive than IEDIAA, and it doesn't reflect our own institutional culture, um, but I will use it occasionally in this presentation, especially in the context of tri-agency programs and policies, because this is the language that they uh, typically use. Okay, so uh, why is IEDI AA relevant to research? So there is um, ample evidence that shows that high-performing collaborative research teams consist of diverse members who are committed to uh, common outcomes. And diverse teams are also more successful at retaining trainees and staff. Considering equity in the research process promotes research excellence, uh, by making it ethically sound, rigorous, reprodu reproducible, useful, and more relevant to society as a whole. And IEDIAA uh, drives research excellence in several ways, for example, by um, expanding the applicability of research findings and new technologies across many different groups in society, uh, by helping to challenge uh, our research assumptions and biases, uh, by mitigating those biases, and by supporting uh, research outcomes that fairly benefit communities most impacted by the specific research projects. So overall, we can say that um, embedding IEDIAA in research is the process of actively cultivating full, effective, and significant um, engagement of individuals from all backgrounds, including those from equity-serving groups, such as women, indigenous people, uh, black people, uh, racialized communities, LGBTQ plus communities, uh, and so forth. And it's about uh, including those groups in both research design and research practice. I really love this picture. <laughs> it I think we it really uh, shows uh, in in a, in a very accessible way what we are really dealing with when we're talking about uh, equity in research. So so the overarching goal of embedding IEDIAA in research is to build um, a more just research ecosystem, which uh, which means dismantling the barriers that prevent people from equity deserving groups from thriving and from benefiting equally as researchers, students, uh, staff and members of groups that are uh, impacted by the research outcomes. And of course, um, when we think about our our own sphere of influence, um, as individuals, we may we may feel powerless sometimes, or we may feel um, limited in our capacity to achieve this systemic change. It seems like a very overwhelming goal, but we can affect smaller change within our immediate research environments by providing people uh, with tools that address their uh, their individual needs to to level the field. 
And so we can call it a micro change, or I like to call it a 1% change. So this is what we can kind of do at an individual level, and it depends on our own research context. And then collectively, um, as members of specific faculties, universities, um, institutions, and professional associations, we can advocate and hopefully work together to, um, to achieve transformation at a structural systemic level. Uh, so basically fix the tree within our research ecosystem. So the good news is that uh, the Canadian research landscape has uh, certainly shifted and evolved in recent years in response to concerted efforts and advocacy of equity deserving groups. Um, and also in response to uh, the funding agencies, new policies in terms of IEDIAA and their commitment to addressing uh, systemic barriers in academia. So for example, the granting agencies now have uh, new strategies and guidelines to support black research, um, indigenous research and accessibility in research. And there are also clear expectations towards uh, research teams in terms of integrating um, equity considerations in research design and practice. And for explicitly uh, including these considerations in, uh, in their funding proposals. We also have a wealth of training resources that assist our research community in advancing their equity goals. And we have witnessed uh, the emergence of new specialized advisory roles within the university research portfolios and faculties. So uh, Tracy Ann's role and my role are, are some examples. Um, and because of these uh, developments, uh, many researchers have gained new knowledge and uh, improved their IEDIAA skills and competencies. And so here at Queens, we are committed to advancing the principles of IEDIAA in all aspects of research, uh, including the production of knowledge, equitable access to funding opportunities, and inclusive and diverse research team composition. Um, and the university recognizes that uh, IEDIAA policies and practices strengthen the research community as well as the quality, uh, social relevance, outcomes, and impacts of research. For example, uh, Queens' new strategic research plan, which is currently in development and it is being shared uh, for feedback. So if you'd like to provide any comments, uh, feel free to check out our BPR website. Uh, but in its draft form, uh, it already states that we are committed to enriching our research community and our scholarship through the lens and values of accessibility, equity, diversity, inclusion, and indigenization. And we also have other important documents at Queens which guide the equity work and research and in other aspects of academic environment. Uh, for example, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission Task Force uh, final report reaffirms the uh, importance of reciprocity and the principle of uh, nothing about us without us in research that is co-created with indigenous communities. Our university is also a signatory of the uh, Scarborough Charter, which actively addresses the underrepresentation of Black researchers in academia and supports Black research excellence. And so all of that to say that IEDIAA uh, is now firmly embedded in our research landscape. It is part of a suite of competencies and skills that all researchers and aspiring researchers um, are uh, expected to have. So as I mentioned before, embedding IEDIAA in research involves two main components. So the first one is the um, integration of IEDIAA considerations in research design, and the second one is research practice. So IEDIAA in research design uh, focuses on uh, specific research projects and ensures that these um, equity considerations are incorporated throughout the research process, if applicable in specific contexts. And IEDIAA and research practice, on the other hand, is all about the environment in which research uh, occurs. So it generally involves uh, three areas, uh, team composition and recruitment, uh, training and access to professional development opportunities, and inclusive research and work environment. So to kind of sum it up, IEDIAA and research design is more contextual and it is driven by, uh, by specific research projects while uh, IEDIAA in research practice applies to uh, kind of a broader work in research environment uh, where research takes place. 
and they are interconnected and complementary in that they both uh, have the potential to build a more inclusive research ecosystem, so they, uh, they work in tandem. So let's dive deeper into IEDIAA and research design. Uh, inclusive research design means that equity considerations are incorporated into each or any stage of the research process if applicable. So we're talking about research questions, study design, methodology, data collection, analysis, and uh, dissemination of research results or knowledge mobilization. And something to, uh, to be mindful of when it comes to inclusivity in research design is that uh, we, need to, we need to realize that people with different identities experience the results of research differently. Uh, the intersectionality of those identities and privileges and power will make them experience the outcomes of research in a very different way. So essentially, uh, the main question that you should be asking yourself when designing research from, from equity perspective is um, whether your specific research project has the potential to impact uh, specific uh, groups or different diverse groups of humans in the, in the near future. And we can embed inclusivity in research through uh, different approaches. Some examples are uh, intersectionality, um, indigenous uh, research, decolonial research, uh, disability justice frameworks, and anti-racist frameworks. And generally, it is beneficial to uh, collect and analyze data considering uh, diversity and identity factors, such as uh, age, gender, culture, uh, disability, education, ethnicity, uh, immigration status, language, uh, neurodiversity, uh, religion, race, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, and the list goes on. So there's definitely uh, an abundance of diversity factors which can be considered in research proposals depending on your field and discipline. Uh, it doesn't mean to it doesn't mean that you have to embed all of them <laughs> in every research project. It just means that you have to uh, kind of think about them broadly and see whether they apply uh, in terms of your specific um, goals, research goals, and the goals of your research studies. So. I want to state very clearly that IEDIAA uh, considerations in research design uh, may not be applicable to every field and every research project. So, for example, if you are uh, a STEM researcher and you are conducting physics uh, experiments to um, explore the most fundamental particles of nature, you're doing research into dark matter, or uh, maybe you're throwing uh, radiation at a piece of steel. Um, in those types of research, there may be no relevant diversity or uh, socio-contextual variables that factor into your study. Um, however, when it comes to knowledge translation, so for example, if a research project includes, uh, uh, you know, it's kind of at an advanced stage when you can think about applications and you can think about uh, development of specific technology or, I don't know, maybe some, some apps, and those, uh, those apps or this technology may impact uh, diverse populations differently or uh, create benefits or risks for, for specific equity deserving groups, then it is absolutely uh, crucial to incorporate IEDIAA considerations um, in the study design. And so here are a few examples of uh, questions uh, you may wish to ask yourself as you reflect on whether IEDIAA considerations are relevant to the design of the research project that you are participating in. So for example, uh, who is making the decisions about research design and whose intellectual leadership is driving the project? So uh, when you look at, uh, you know, at a team or a group of people who are uh, sitting at a table and discussing a new study, do you see a diverse group of people or maybe it's rather uh, homogenous? Um, are certain diversity factors or their intersections known to, to impact the research uh, topic? Uh, can you collect data that uh, incorporates perspectives of different demographic groups? Um, how will individuals with different and intersecting social identities experience the results of your research? And then thinking about uh, knowledge mobilization, uh, how will you ensure that your, uh, that your knowledge dissemination efforts reach diverse audiences? 
So applying IEDI AA considerations to research design might uh, manifest differently in different studies and disciplines. So uh, just to give you a few examples in terms of how inclusive research design can be applied. Uh, for example, in sociology, uh, inclusive research design may mean uh, conducting a literature review about uh, the impact of surveillance technologies on racialized communities. Um, in education, it may include uh, using arts-based and trauma-informed methods to explore accessible approaches to learning. Uh, in medical intervention uh, studies, um, it might manifest as developing an inclusive process of recruitment into a clinical trial and addressing barriers to participation in research for groups that are typically underrepresented in specific, specific types of clinical trials. In engineering, it can be about uh, co-creation with indigenous communities to um, inform research questions and the design of a study about waste management in northern communities. And again, in physics, uh, we can talk about uh, knowledge translation that enables the uh, development of new medical Im imaging devices that can positively impact health outcomes for, for underserved populations. So moving on to inclusive research practice, uh, as I mentioned before, it is about achieving and sustaining a diverse environment where all members of the research community can thrive regardless of race, gender, ethnicity, uh, religious beliefs, or any other uh, identity factors. So it's not, about, um, it's not about specific projects, it's about the broader environment in which research takes place. And this process of uh, applying IEDIAA in research practice starts with the analysis of context, which uh, helps researchers to um, identify the key barriers and challenges that prevent uh, members of diverse groups from thriving in the research field, institution, uh, and team. And then to uh, kind of start identifying how they will take action to affect meaningful change, even if it's just a small, uh, small scale improvement. So again, once the barriers are identified, the team then needs to consider how they can make change in the three main areas of research practice. So the first area is uh, promoting diversity in the team composition and recruitment. Uh, when I talk about the team, I usually think about faculty members, students, collaborators, community members, uh, partners, and staff members. Um, and then diversity in team composition applies to different identities, of course, but it also encompasses uh, different career stages, sectors, institutions, regions, uh, and countries that the team members are from. The second area is considering diversity and equity in mentoring, training, and access to professional development opportunities. And the third area is fostering an equitable, inclusive, and accessible research work environment for team members. And so depending on the nat nature and scale of your research program, uh, certain areas may not apply to your context, or you may also identify other areas of research practice, such as uh, maybe partnerships or research governance, if you're part of a large research institute. Uh, but these are the main, these three are the main areas of research practice that I would like to focus on today. So as I mentioned, the first step to developing inclusive research practices and teams is conducting the analysis of context um, and systemic barriers, uh, which need to be identified in the, in the analysis of context. Uh, those systemic barriers in academia um, have been very well described. There are a lot of sources that you can, you can review in terms of uh, getting some examples. Uh, some uh, common examples of systemic barriers uh, within, within uh, the academic context include racism, unconscious or um, implicit biases such as CV and accent bias, uh, white normativity, tokenism, ableism, uh, wage gaps between different groups and increased workloads for, uh, for members of equity deserving groups. And so depending on your research context, these barriers may manifest differently. For example, uh, they can manifest as uh, inaccessible research environments. Uh, perhaps uh, they can manifest as inequitable financial supports for international versus domestic uh, students. 
Uh, maybe it's about lack of access to diverse mentors and roles, role models within your research environment. Uh, if you're conducting field work, there may be some safety concerns during field work for uh, members of specific groups. And of course, there are many, many other challenges depending on your context. So I just wanted to share a few examples of some of the questions that researchers and research trainees can consider as they uh, reflect on the inclusive research practices in their teams, uh, as they analyze their context and the barriers in their research environment. So again, the first question is about the systemic barriers. Uh, you may wish to also ask yourself uh, whether there are certain groups that are underrepresented in a specific team or institution or field. Uh, if the team leadership has made deliberate efforts to recruit members of those groups, uh, does the team have an IDIAA statement, policies, or a code of conduct that guides uh, their work in, in an inclusive way? Uh, how can the team support uh, equal awareness and access to uh, training opportunities for all? Uh, of course, accessibility is another uh, important consideration. So what are the accessibility features in the research environment? Uh, who from the team has access to it? Uh, what if there is a person who can't perform certain types of tasks in this research space? And how can the team support them? And then... Uh, what will the team do if there are any equity concerns and how will they manage complaints and, and conflicts that may occur within the team? So in terms of examples of IEDI AA uh, in research practice, they may, they may include uh, intentional recruitment efforts that target organizations uh, supporting members of equity deserving groups, uh, individual mentorship plans uh, for trainees that include access to IEDIAA training and to mentorship networks for underrepresented groups, uh, supporting equal awareness and access to training opportunities through uh, broad advertisement strategies and uh, also through uh, setting aside a portion of your budget or your funding to support the participation of students in training. So for example, uh, funding for conferences, for travel, for childcare accommodation and so forth. And of course, in, in terms of inclusive work environment, one example of addressing that aspect uh, of your research practice is to establish clear policies for, for addressing IEDIAA concerns. All right, so I also wanted to uh, give you a few examples of EDI requirements, both in terms of research design and research practice that you may uh, encounter in many different Canadian funding opportunities. Uh, I'm not going to go into too many details and this uh, table certainly <laughs> doesn't cover all funding uh, competitions that you may come across. So if you have questions about a specific opportunity, please feel free to uh, reach out and I'd be happy to, to help you or connect you with, uh, with a specific research project advisor in our research portfolio. Um, and of course, I uh, just wanted to say that uh, you should strive to, to embed EDI in research regardless of whether you plan to apply for research funding or not. Uh, but many funding calls do require you to um, craft an EDI statement or, or fill out specific EDI sections. So um, it's good to be aware of the specific information that you need to provide. So as you can see uh, on, in the table, some competitions require uh, very little in terms of EDI. For example, Health Sciences Granting Agency, uh, CIHR, uh, the, specific, the project grant application only asks uh, the applicants to include uh, this, the description of how they applied sex and gender-based analysis plus in their research design in cases where those considerations are relevant. So basically they're asking about EDI and research design considerations uh, there are no EDI requirements in relation to the team environment. But then other competitions um, have more comprehensive requirements in terms of EDI, and that includes uh, NSERP Discovery, uh, Canada Foundation for Innovation, Innovation Fund, um, SHRC Partnership Grants, and the New Frontiers in Research Fund uh, Exploration and Transformation Stream. So for example, uh, the, the New Frontiers in Research Fund uh, funding opportunity um, requires the applicants to describe the considerations relevant to both EDI and research design and EDI and research practice. 
Uh, however, uh, it is important to point out that EDI and research practice in this competition is pass or fail. So that means that if you fail EDI, your entire application is sunk, so it will not be successful. So the, the, the stakes are pretty high in some of those competitions. And it's also important to note that some funding calls place more emphasis on specific aspects of EDI. So for example, answer discovery is heavily focused on the training environment, uh, and shirk partnership grants in addition to uh, describing EDI in research design and practice. The applicants are also uh, asked to consider uh, or think about uh, how they will uh, ensure that there are equitable opportunities within their research related partnership. And uh, CFIIF uh, is, is, is an opportunity that's focusing on research infrastructure. So they ask the applicants to describe how they will ensure uh, equitable access to research infrastructure for all team members and partners. And just as a final thought, uh, beyond the requirements listed here about EDI sections or uh, content in specific competitions, um, it is generally um, a wise practice to weave the EDI considerations throughout the entire application. So for example, uh, there may be other relevant sections for the EDI, such as uh, budget, research governance, uh, risk assessment, et cetera. So whether you choose to apply for research funding or not, I would still strongly encourage you to build an IEDI AA and research practice action plan simply because uh, it will be beneficial to your research, your team, your broader institutional research environment, and it will keep you uh, help keep you accountable and accountability is a crucial piece when it comes to um, equity work. And so at the VPR, we have uh, developed a methodology for creating these action plans uh, based on the theory of change, which I will explain in just a minute. Uh, the plan centers around research practice uh, because research design is, again, it's very contextual. Uh, it's driven by specific research projects. It doesn't mean that we can't talk about research design, but it's a kind of like a separate process. Uh, so here I will focus on, on research practice. We don't really have a lot of time, so I just needed to focus on something. <laughs> so what is feasible to achieve within your action plan uh, depends on your context. It depends on your capacity, uh, your funding, the size of your team, and the level of knowledge and IEDI AA competency that you uh, currently have. So perhaps, um, perhaps you're a novice because you're just getting started on your equity journey. And so your efforts uh, will likely be focused on uh, training and building your own uh, EDI skills. Uh, you may be a mentor or an emerging mentor who is uh, already incorporating these principles and considerations into your research environment, but to different degrees. Or you may be an advocate who is championing IEDIAA locally. Uh, you're recognized by faculty, students, and staff in your in your uh, in your faculty as someone who uh, offers support and who uh, is striving to uh, better IEDII in research spaces. Or if you're a sponsor, then you're probably a leader in your field and you're pushing uh, the boundaries of EDI and research and training um, outside of your uh, immediate department, faculty, and maybe even beyond the university spaces. So it's important to, uh, to do some self-assessment first before you start planning. So this is a standard planning and evaluation cycle, which I'm sure everyone here is familiar with. Uh, it can be applied to many different contexts, industries, and projects. And that includes um, IEDIAA and research practice initiatives. So it typically follows uh, several stages. And uh, so we can start with trying to understand our situation, assessing the current state or EDI circumstances in our research environment. Then we move on to defining our goals and developing an action plan. Uh, we implement uh, the plan, we test it, we learn by trial and error, uh, and then we uh, evaluate our progress regularly to, to help us stay accountable. And in the next couple of slides, um, I will be focusing on the action plan part of this, of this planning and evaluation cycle. 
So in terms of the steps to develop an action plan, uh, the overarching framework is modeled after uh, the EDI and research practice sections of the New Frontiers and Research Fund applications. Uh, but we kind of added the theory of change uh, spin to it. So um, our starting point is the um, analysis of context, again, assessing the barriers. Uh, this is a crucial step. I will not discuss it in detail because I want to give you sort of like an eagle view of the general approach. But if you have any questions, feel free to uh, reach out to me anytime. So once we are done uh, with assessing the barriers, we can then consider the three main areas of research practice and how we can embed uh, equity in each of these areas based on the challenges that we have previously identified. Um, and then finally, the last step is using the theory of change to craft an action plan. So the idea is kind of to define uh, the desired change for each area of research practice and uh, work backwards to map out the uh, necessary steps to achieve it. So moving from impact to outcomes to outputs, um, activities and inputs. So here is a quick overview of the theory of change. So when we work to identify those uh, different components, it helps to think about them as uh, a series of questions or preconditions. So um, impact is defined as uh, the one improvement that we would like to see in the long term. Uh, outcomes are uh, the medium term effects which need to occur to achieve a more comprehensive change. And then outputs are uh, the results of the activities. They are usually framed as uh, tangible products or deliverables. Um, and activities are essentially uh, what people need to get done to produce the outputs. Um, and finally, inputs are the resources that will enable the researchers and their teams to uh, complete the activities. So again, this template applies to uh, each area of the research practice. Uh, so the researchers need to uh, map out the same sequence, starting with the impact and ending with the inputs for, uh, for team composition and recruitment, for training and for inclusion. And of course, monitoring progress and staying accountable is crucial. So that means um, adding a time frame to your action plan and um, assigning responsibilities in terms of uh, achieving the desired change. Uh, we also encourage the researchers to think about measuring their progress and creating, creating some qualitative and uh, quantitative indicators. So now I would like to uh, quickly walk you through, uh, through a fairly straightforward scenario that demonstrates the implementation of the theory of change in a specific area of research practice. Um, so in this hypothetical scenario, a faculty member is trying to make improvements in the area of team composition and recruitment. Um, they know that onboarding is the last but crucial part of recruitment. It's often overlooked. And um, one of the barriers that they have identified is a lack of clear and transparent uh, onboarding processes. Um, and so because they know that a strong lab culture, strong onboarding practices um, influence uh, the motivation of students from equity deserving group, groups to continue in the field, they decided to do something about it. And so they are trying to figure out how they can create a better, more supportive process with uh, clear expectations and accessible information. And so they have identified uh, specific steps from impact to inputs that are uh, required to, to achieve this change. So let's take a look at the specific uh, steps. So starting with the impact, uh, here it is defined as uh, improved and more transparent onboarding experience for the new members of the Lab X or Research Group X. Uh, here we are trying to uh, clearly describe who will experience the change and uh, at what level the change will occur. So we're not talking about the faculty, we're not talking about the department, we're not talking about the institution, we're talking about our team. And so the outcomes state that the new members have easy access to comprehensive lab information and that they are uh, adequately supported during onboarding. 
Um, and so here the desired change is described in more details in terms of um, what needs to be implemented media, medium term. Um, and so we can have one or more outcomes. It all depends on the scale of our, our work or our initiative. And in order to achieve the outcome, uh, specific outputs will need to be created, such as a body system, uh, clear communication mechanisms and channels, a uh, perhaps a, a database or a repository of lab information and uh, formal onboarding documents. And the activities can include selecting uh, onboarding mentors, providing them with training, uh, setting up instant messaging apps, cloud storage services, team meetings, uh, organizing lab information, uh, developing and uploading a package with onboarding materials such as welcome letters, checklists, policies, a code of conduct, IEDIAA statement, and so forth. And all of this will be possible because the team has uh, certain resources at their disposal, such as their expertise and knowledge of lab processes, knowledge about uh, collaboration and storage apps and other communications uh, tools. Maybe there's there's a communications expert at the university who can provide some insights and strategies or a colleague who has already uh, done a similar process. And so they can maybe provide some advice in terms of improving engagement. And they're also, uh, uh, volunteers who will become the onboarding mentors to help establish um, a body system. And of course, there's funding for, for some subscriptions. So in this scenario, whether whether the faculty member will be actually able to, uh, to achieve the impact and the outcomes depends on how big their team is, what are the resources at their disposal, and the timeline that they set for this project. And they can, of course, uh, reduce the scale of this initiative as needed. They can reduce the number of activities, or uh, they can be strategic about the activities that they will prioritize. And of course, the focus is on accountability again. So here we have a list of people who are responsible for the success of this initiative. Uh, we have a timeline for implementation and we have a few uh, examples of indicators which can be used to um, measure our progress. So uh, if you're eager and excited to, uh, to get started uh, and to develop your very own action plan, uh, you don't need to worry because uh, we have a lot of resources to support you. Um, so we have created a workbook with a lot of useful information. Uh, we have some action plan templates for you, practical uh, exercises that can help uh, guide you and your teams through this planning process. And so uh, if you're interested, I would uh, encourage you to work with me one-on-one uh, -on -one so that I can um, advise you and support you from start to finish. And so we would usually start this process by booking a series of appointments so that I can introduce uh, the action plan methodology and the workbook, uh, discuss any questions you might have and provide feedback on the drafts of your plan. And so in between our meetings, you would have an opportunity to go back to your teams, trainees, collaborators, and uh, have some discussions. Uh, you can also complete specific exercises from the workbook individually or collectively with your team if you prefer. And uh, you can start uh, filling out the action plan template and bring, uh, bring the drafts back to me for feedback. And the whole process, I'm not going to lie, <laughs> it is a time commitment. It usually takes uh, several months. But of course, I'm happy to, to work with your, with your timeline. And so uh, if you're interested in crafting an action plan, please feel free to reach out and I'm, I'm available to, uh, to support you every step of the way. And so here you can see a few examples of uh, resources that you may wish to check, uh, check out if you would like to uh, learn more. Uh, there's really a wealth of, you know, there's just so many great resources about inclusive research out there, but I think uh, these are a good place to start. And I especially uh, recommend an excellent online training uh, that was developed here at Queens. It's called EDI and Research Modules. And so thank you so much for bearing with me. <laughs> I will end my presentation here and I'm happy to take any questions uh, or comments. Hey, thank you so much, um, Alex. Thank you for your insightful presentation on embedding EDI into um, our research practices. If we have any questions, we could 
you can raise your hand or you could, you could type it in chat. Um, alternatively, if you have questions specifically for Alex and you'd like to reach out to her or myself, you can do so. So that's an option as well. So we can ask our questions here or we can reach out to Alex if you have a more context specific question for her. say no I think we I don't think we have any questions Alex okay so it seems we do not have any questions so we think we're going to end here thank you again so much Alex and remember everyone, if you would like um, help with your research and if you have any research question regarding your, your own personal research, drafting a research plan, please feel free to reach out to Alex and I'm sure she's willing you know, to share her knowledge, extensive knowledge with you. Thanks again, everyone. And um, hopefully we'll have more of these series to come. Thank you. Thanks so much. Take care. Thank you. Bye.